Uh, I'm Rick Crandall with KEZW Radio. I've been the morning show host, host of the Breakfast Club for going on 21 years now at KEZW, which in... My mother, God bless her soul, she used to applaud too that, that her son actually had a job that long anywhere. She thought that was pretty amazing. In radio years, that's like 170,000, so um, pretty amazing to be at one place that long. Right now, I want to introduce our very special guest. Those of you who know me, and that's probably about six of you, um, those of you who know me know that I spend a great deal of time here in our community working with Colorado's military veterans. Um, it has been a passion of mine. I served in the Air Force for six years during peacetime. I can't belong to the American Legion because nothing happened while I was in. Uh, I tell them I take credit for the fact we were at peace those six years because I was in uniform, but they haven't bought any of that. But I spend uh, a great deal of time working with, uh, with our veterans community. Um, Thursdays on my radio program are Veterans Day Thursdays, where we dedicate time to uh, talking about veterans' issues, uh, having veterans in. Uh, it all started uh, for me 20 years ago with World War II veterans who came in, Pearl Harbor survivors who came in to share their story of December 7th, 1941. We'll have the 70th anniversary of that event this year. Can you imagine 70 years? So imagine the youngest veteran there, 17 at the time, should we say? We'll give him 17, right? He's 87 years old now. As that generation leaves us now, the VA tells us at the rate of almost 1,700 a day. In fact, there are now more living Vietnam veterans than there are World War II veterans. Uh, so that generation, so if you get a chance to hear stories, hear them quickly and don't let them pass. And if you get the chance to hear stories of our young veterans serving today, uh, I'm seated with two tonight and I'm thrilled. Uh, one of them a dear friend, the other I'm getting to know along with his companion and now you're gonna get a chance to know him as well. Luis Carlos Montalvan is a 17 year veteran, former captain in the US Army, where he earned the Combat Action Badge, two bronze stars and the Purple Heart. Luis is the author of Until Tuesday, which debuted 18 on the New York Times bestseller list remained on the list for five weeks. Luis shares his amazing story of the war after the war with invisible disabilities, post-traumatic stress disorder and traumatic brain injury, and how his service dog, Tuesday, has given him hope and healing. Before Tuesday came into Luis's life, he was overwhelmed by his debilitating injuries, memories, and could barely leave the house due to agoraphobia. Tuesday assists Luis with his balance, retrieves things off of the floor, reminds him to take his medications, wakes him when he's having flashbacks, gets him out of the house, and gives him the unconditional love we all need to give us strength and a whole lot more. I invite you to welcome to the stage, please, Luis Carlos Montalvan and Tuesday. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rick, and uh, thank you, Wayne and Sherry. Thanks. Thank you to all of those of, of, uh, of you in this audience who um, obviously care about uh, invisible disabilities, disabilities that afflict uh, many, many millions in this country. Thank you to the veterans in the audience. God bless you and your families. And um, from afar, I'd like to thank my parents, and uh, of course, I'd like to thank God, because I, I, uh, I believe very much that he is with us here, and that um, 
and that he's shining a light on, on this occasion. So my, my remarks um, are unprepared, deliberately, been on a book tour for the past summer. And uh, it's been quite an intense summer um, with some amazing experiences. I, uh, I can't believe I forgot to thank my, 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 uh, my furry spirit, my angel, Tuesday. Tuesday is... He is my, you know, he's my sunrise and he's my sunset. I, I, he is my alpha and my omega. He, people, people ask <clears throat> when they see the cover of the book or they come to hear the, the name of the book until Tuesday, a wounded warrior and the golden retriever who saved him. They think that, you know, you, generally their initial question is something like, um, well, how did, how did he save you? You know, was he in Iraq or did he pull you from a car or, or you know, something, some feat that, that he might have done to save me? And it's kind of interesting because it, in a way, parallels disabilities. You know, physical disabilities, visible disabilities, and invisible disabilities. You know, Tuesday saves my life every day. Quite literally. People think that, people have a tendency to think, not those in this audience, but people have a tendency to think that in order to be disabled, you have to look like Stephen Hawking, or you have to look like the late Christopher Reeve, or you have to have a wheelchair, or a scooter, or look unconventional in some way, facially or feature in, in feature. And it sort of amazes me because I remember not too many years ago when I was a quote unquote able bodied, physically fit, fit to fight, you know, poster child of the military. You know, I mean, people would, people would look at me and think, I wouldn't want to mess with that guy. And, um, And, and so then, the, the wars began, and in my initial tour, uh, I hasten to say that I, I, I was attacked. Um, there was one particular attack that in which I was wounded, um, because there was, but that, that attack was not, is not the, uh, the biggest obstacle in my life. People tend to, even David Letterman, when we were on Letterman in July, 
take, they tend to fixate on a, you know, a single night, an attack on a single night. You know, because they, because society needs something concrete to, to lock their brain on. They, 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 they can't fathom the notion of chronic conditions. They can't fathom a progressive, deteriorate, deteriorating condition. They, they need some calamity, some chaotic, single traumatic event to feel pain or understanding or, or, or to be able to intellectualize it, really. And it's such a sham. That, that, that they have to think that way. Um, because the reality is that, is that most trauma is uh, the, what, what strikes you, what, what affects you, takes time to affect you. Uh, particularly psychological trauma. Um, I mean, I could cite, if I wanted, I could have brought a list of 20 New England Journal of Medicine, Harvard Medicine, you know, journals that would very well articulate that fact. And yet, the press, and David Letterman, whom I like, by the way, and I'm grateful to, because people did learn from that. They did learn about assistance dogs. They did learn about um, a little bit about uh, about struggle. But it was only 50% real. 50% or more was invisible. I'm going to talk about some light, and I'm going to talk a little. You know, talk, I'm going to talk about some darkness too, because that's the reality of life, and that's the reality of overcoming and getting on a journey of healing. Without darkness, there is no light, and vice versa. So to talk about one and not the other is unhelpful. Darkness. And Tuesday and I are, are proponents, advocates, really, of not just veterans with disabilities, but people with disabilities. And it came it was a transition for me, as it is a transition for many warriors, military service members, to go from being amongst America's most ready, willing, and able, and lethal uh, citizens to being broken. Being, broke, being a broken warrior is antithetical to being in the military. And as a result, the military, uh, it doesn't, it hasn't changed its culture to accept broken warriors and understand that broken warriors are not to be hazed, harassed, mistreated, 
given non-judicial punishment or courts martial because they are on sl new sleep meds because they can't sleep because they they have PTSD and then they can't make muster so then you have a command climate that wants to instill good discipline and order and rather than giving the service member the help she needs they resort to the old boot, which is what is so common, has been so common since our country was founded. It, 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 it's amazing to me because every other month I see an article from generals, civilian leaders, White House, Congress, Remember, elected officials who say they can't understand, they don't know what the problem is. They can't, they can't understand the problem. And so they don't, and so they can't solve it because they don't understand the problem. And it, it motivates us to continue going on with the messages contained in Until Tuesday and at the book events. Namely, that 18 veterans a day commit suicide in this country. 18 veterans a day commit suicide in this country. Now you have to go back to Vietnam to think of numbers of casualties of KIA like that. You know, 30, 31 times 18. You don't see those types of KIA in Iraq and Afghanistan. There may have been one or two days in the entire last decade where that has been the case. And so I offer to you, if 18 veterans a day are committing suicide and a thousand more are attempting it, where is the war? Where's the war? Is it in Afghanistan? Is it in Iraq? Or is it here, on American soil? And if that's the case, why aren't the generals, why aren't the politicians, why isn't the press screaming? from the top of their lungs about this war? And why aren't they doing anything about it? I mean, seriously doing anything about it. I don't think any general, any general, can say he or she is doing her job if 18 veterans a day are committing suicide. Because in the 17 years I spent in the Army, the unspoken, unwritten motto was take care of your soldiers. Take care of your soldiers. Take care of your soldiers. Well, how is 18 a day taking care of your soldiers? Whether they are still in or whether they got out. I left the Army. I have a lot of friends who were superior to me and subordinate to me who I still care about. And they're still my soldiers. I call them. I write them. I mean, we live in, the, we live in an age of where communication is so easy that then there's no excuse. So, how can any general in good conscience, how can any cabinet member, how can any president in good conscience say he is doing, he or she is doing her job to help veterans? 
And the only reason why we know that statistic is because the VA leaked it. Uh, they, 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 they mistakenly leaked it. An unscrupulous VA official was insecure about his email. It was a long shh, literally, in, in the text of the email. And then Veterans for Common Sense, a very good veterans service organization, sued and recently won a landmark case in San Francisco in circuit court. And more and more records came out. It sort of turns my stomach every time the VA or a, a journalist, and I, I, I'm, I'll lump myself in there with them. I went to Columbia's journalism school. But you know what? Um, how, can you, how can you write articles about this new VA medical center opening and this one closing ad nauseum and not write about the real problems of extremely high veteran homelessness, divorce, substance abuse, um, suicide, uh, domestic abuse, you name it. I, um, it breaks my heart, it breaks my heart to have to tell people about this. I mean, it absolutely breaks my heart. I get emails every day, since the book came out especially. I mean, we were advocates before, we did a lot of writing, we got emails. But since the book came out, thousands of emails. My parents think I should just have a book about including these emails, because these emails are... Um, so touching and so sad and, and also so hopeful. People who, whose sons or daughters or cousins or spouses committed suicide or, or, on, or just who, who, who or, people, or, or people who never went to war and experienced the trauma of rape or, crime, or some domestic crime or abandonment, because in many ways war is a metaphor for life. And the thing about the book, which people tell me, because you really just don't know this when you write something like that. You really don't, you have no sense of what you've written until others tell you what you've written. That, that it, more so than, than anything they've read, articulates in, in detail the day-to-day -day struggle of traumatic brain injury, post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, alcoholism, darkness, um, and yet it takes you on our journey of healing. Our, that, that point in the valley when when uh, I was either going to sink or swim. I have a great deal. I have a tremendous degree of faith in, in, in all of us. I see one person, I mean, they're in this room alone, there are dozens, scores of, of cases of, of struggle and, and survival and, and healing and triumph. You know, I think one of the last frontiers that we have to, to really embark on and, 
and well, I'm really embark on in a, in a deep-minded way and in a spiritual way and in a physical way is the one of overcoming, is A, being, learning to be compassionate beings, learning to be compassionate beings. And and being reaching out to our our friends, our families, our neighbors, our communities, our country, our world in compassionate ways, in sensitive ways, in ways that are honorable. Writing until Tuesday was the hardest thing I've ever done. The hardest thing I've ever done. I thought I was going to die. And I'm not a wimpy guy. Because I was, re I was having to rehash, relive, re-remember in detail many, many, many instances of trauma and dubious decisions, decisions that men and women make on the battlefield that, thank God, most people don't ever have to make. So Tuesday came into my life like, like a, you know, I, I, I firmly believe in angels. I mean, I, I believe in the Holy Spirit. And I'm not proselytizing, and I'm not, you know, I'm not a Bible-thumping person believe in the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, but I'm not a Bible-thumping person. But Tuesday came into my life, and it was a spiritual thing. And, and there are a series of events that, um, that I articulate better in the book that if you, if, you know, if one were to make a linear, you know, chart of, of things that, that, that begat other things, I think you couldn't easily dismiss that idea. Um, I'm going to move over here and sit down with my with my Tuesday. I, hope, I know some of you might not be able to see, but one of the, the favorite things that I love to do with my dog, with my friend, my prosthetic, my, my brother, my counselor, my silly furry boy, is, is as simple as this, is, is this, it's a brush. Most, many of you have one of these. But I, when I was in the, when I, when I was drinking a liter a day, because the VA was so, Undress. It was so difficult to deal with. Come. 
And because I, the medications that I was on and the individual and group therapy that I was on was so uh, difficult to deal with, I would spend hours a day taking care of my Tuesday. Just grooming my boy and he loves to be groomed since he was three years old. Yes. Yes. Since he was three years, days old, he's been working. He started his training at three days old. And I, and, um, and what I love about this, and I, I do it twice a day, sometimes three times a day, I, uh, I love to take care of him because, because he takes care of me. I mean, I wouldn't be here if it weren't for Tuesday. Uh, I wouldn't laugh as hard as I do and as often as I do if it weren't for Tuesday. You know, we got in this morning, we left San Francisco this morning at 5.45 on a plane for Denver. And... Um, then when we got to the Marriott here, and this isn't just a gig on the Marriott, because, listen, we've been on CBS and other channels where the same things have happened. But we, went to, we got here to the Marriott, and they said no dogs Tuesday. Got to the front desk, they said no dogs. Now, Tuesday wears this vest everywhere. And, you know, <laughs> we got here at, uh, I don't know, two one o'clock or so. And, and Tuesday, Tuesday I knew I was pretty stressed out because, you know, when you have post-traumatic stress disorder and other afflictions, when you, when you, when you are a service member and you put your flesh on the line for your country, and you write articles, and you speak, and you write op-eds, and you travel the country, and you write a book, and you go on National Geographic, and you go on David Letterman, and you do everything you can to help inform, help, and offer hope, and then you come to the Marriott, and they say no dogs. I look to Aristotle's, one of his 10 virtues, which is often forgotten. And that was righteous indignation. Seemingly forgotten virtue. Not anger, mind you. Righteous indignation. Sort of anger focused in a, in a, in a, in a way that you seek justice ethically. Not sinfully, which I know that sounds religious, but part of ethics and moral, morality come, you know, the, the spirituality is, is in there. And I gotta tell you, I uh, was livid. Because, I mean, here we are. Here, here I am checking into a, a, a hotel, tired after traveling, checking into this hotel where tonight we're going to have an event about invisible disabilities. And the people at the front desk don't know the Americans with Disabilities Act, they don't know what a service dog is, and they ask us to leave. Do you know what that does to someone with PTSD and with someone who has an invisible disability, which could be any of you? What it does is it, not only does it upset you, for, for many people, it takes on a different effect than me because I was, remember, I was an army captain, so, and I was a warrior, so, you know, I, I don't fade away quite easily. I've made it my, at least my current mission, to educate and to not allow that type of thing to go on. But what it does to me and to other people with disabilities is it sends them into their apartments and or into their homes 
for days on end because it reminds them, it's like throwing their disability back in their face. Oh, you're disabled. Oh, you know, I, I'm not welcome. I'm somehow mucked up. I'm not like everybody else. I'm not good enough. That's what it does. And some people, they, they think that, they think I go looking for this. <laughs> I don't go looking for this. I'm not an activist. I'm an advocate. So, I contacted the manager, and then the hotel manager, and essentially told them, and this is righteous indignation, that they'd be, they'd be sending me a letter of apology that also included um, the guarantee that they would train all of their staff at the Marriott with, on the provisions of the ADA. And after some dialogue, uh, the gentleman, uh, and after I said that I'd sued, uh, I'd sued before, and I'd be perfectly willing to leave the hotel and, and um, find another hotel in Denver and, uh, you know. Uh, so hopefully tomorrow or the next day we'll have a letter and I'll post it on Facebook um, so that other people around the country understand that within all of us, within all of us, within each of us is a Rosa Parks. So, Tuesday, come here. Sit. Good boy, come here. Mm -hmm. Good boy. <laughs> Tuesday, he, he, he knows applause now since we've been going to events, so he gets all excited. But. Listen, I've, I, uh, I wanna, in advance, that, you know, uh, congratulate all the award winners. Um, you deserve it and more. Um, many of the people who who should be here to honor you are not here. And we make up for them. So um, God bless everyone in here. And, um, and thank you for for championing, for having the compassion to understand disabilities, physical, invisible, and for caring about all of us, really. Thank you. Tuesday, remember that your beef was at the table. <laughs>
Tuesday, Tuesday, come. Psst. Come here. He's finding a way. Thank you, thank you, everyone. Sit down. Tuesday, come on. Good boy. All right, all right. Good boy. Thanks. Okay. Now, it's not right that you brushed Tuesday after he was rubbing up against me for an hour over there. Is that the most beautiful dog ever? I'm serious. That is one gorgeous animal. All right, Luis, you stay up here. Wayne, come back on up. Tuesday, come here. We're going to present our 2011. Excuse me. Tuesday, come. Somebody's giving him food. I know it. <laughs> come here. You know what I'm talking about. Come here. Psst. Where is he? Tuesday, come here. Okay. Hey. Control your dog. <laughs> Tuesday, come here. Never mind, I'll. I'll. It's, it's all good. They're, they're making friends over there. All right, so as we begin our awards presentation this evening, we thought it would be right to present the first ever Invisible Hero Honors Award to our speaker this evening, Luis Carlos Mantovan. There's going to be a discussion right now, I'll tell you. <laughs> and so far, Tuesday's winning. All right. 